Okay, uh, my name is Mohamed Kazam. I'm an assistant professor at UAB Medical School in the Department of Neurology. Today, we are going to talk about a new area of service that UAB will introduce to our state and our region. It's the autonomic function testing area. So the objectives of this talk is to try to review the anatomic and physiologic basis of different autonomic tests the basic techniques of testing and the principal indication of the autonomic tests. So as we all know that the autonomic nervous system is subdivided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system is critical in maintaining the arterial blood pressure and the cardiovascular response to stress and exercise, and also in maintaining an appropriate sweat response and regulating the temperature. The parasympathetic nervous system, it reciprocally interacts with the sympathetic nervous system in supplying the heart and the other viscera. It also regulates the peristalsis of the GI system and uh, the sphincter relaxation. So functionally, the autonomic nervous system can be subdivided into the parasympathetic cholinergic innervation to the heart and viscera the sympathetic noradrenergic to the heart and the viscera, and the sympathetic cholinergic supply to the skin and sweat glands. It also includes the adrenomedullary supply to the adrenal system and the enteric supply to the GI. However, in the autonomic function testing lab, we evaluate only the first two components. So the three areas of autonomic function testing include the cardiovagal innervation and the cardioadrenergic innervation and the innervation to the sweat glands. Now we will discuss the vagal innervation to the heart and uh, the way we test that is through the first test which is the heart rate response to deep breathing. We all know that the, about the respiratory sinus arrhythmia where our heart rate has to accelerate during inspiration and decelerate during expiration. This is really the most sensitive test for the cardiovagal functions. And reduced heart rate variability is known to be an early sign of autonomic neuropathy as in cases of diabetes and also indicates a worse diagnosis in these poor patients. So in this maneuver, the patient lies supine and three EKG leads is hooked to their chest. And the chest strap is wind around their chest to measure the respiratory movements during inspiration and expiration. They take around eight cycles of deep breathing for five seconds of inspiration and five seconds of expiration. And the machine measures the heart rate response range between maximum and minimum heart rate and average it. This is a record from a normal patient when you see here that the, the chest straps is recording the respiratory movements with inspiration and expiration and the heart rate is fluctuating between peaks and troughs during the process in a normal patient. However, this graph shows, an, shows you an abnormal case of diabetic autonomic neuropathy where you have the patient still breathing, however, there is no variation in their heart rate. The second division of autonomic function tests include the cardioadrenergic innervation, which includes the Valsalva maneuver and the head-up tilt table test. In the Valsalva maneuver, the patient lies supine and a small blood pressure cuff called phenometer is attached to their middle finger and they are instructed to breathe into a bugle and maintain forced expiratory pressure of 40 millimeter mercury for 15 seconds. So just to briefly review the stages of the Valsalva maneuver, phys physiologically they can be uh, divided into four stages. In stage one, what happens is that there is increase in the intrathoracic pressure and increase in the pressure on the thoracic aorta, and that leads to elevation in the blood pressure in stage one. That leads afterwards to decreased venous return, and that leads 
to decrease the, in the blood pressure, a decrease in the blood pressure. After that, the vasomotor system, sympathetic system is activated, and that leads to increase in the vasomotor tone, and that leads again to increase in the heart, in the blood pressure in late phase two. In phase three, when the patient is releasing their valsalva maneuver or their breath, the intrathoracic pressure decreases. And that's a mechanical effect very similar to phase one. And in phase four, what happens really is that the venous return increase due to the drop in the intrathoracic pressure. And in the setting of an activated vasomotor response from late phase two, that leads to overshoot in the blood pressure in phase four. When the baroreceptors in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus sense that overshoot in blood pressure, the, the heart rate has to decelerate. So this is a normal example of Valsalva maneuver when you see the four stages of Valsalva maneuver here, phase one up, early phase two down, late phase two up, phase three down, and then the overshoot in phase four. And the heart rate changes, as you see here, to accelerate in early phase two and decelerate again as a response to, late, to, to phase four. In a patient who have adrenergic failure or orthostatic hypotension, what you can see here, that there is no late phase two, and there is no overshoot in, in phase four, and it takes a long time for the blood pressure to recover to the baseline. In head up tilt test, the patient lies supine for at least five minutes before the test, we attach safety straps around them so they don't fall during the tilt, and the phenometer is still attached to their middle finger. We tilt them to 70 degrees, and the routine tilt period is 10 minutes. So this is a normal heart head up tilt test with the beginning of the tilt marked here and the end of it marked he there. And as you see, the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure do not change that much in normal subjects. There is expected mild increase in the heart rate as a compensatory mechanism to the venous pooling. Just to review some definitions before we get into abnormalities that can be found in the um, uh, head up tilt test, the orthostatic intolerance is development of symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion like dizziness, blackout, giddiness, or symptoms of overactivation like palpitations when the subject stands up and these symptoms clears when the subject laid down, lays down. In orthostatic hypotension, it is defined as systolic blood pressure drop by 20 or diastolic blood pressure drop by 10 within the first three minutes of standing or tilting. The commonly known postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS is defined as development of orthostatic symptoms with an increase in the heart rate for more with more than 30 beat per minute or up to more than 120 within the first 10 minutes of tilting without any drop in blood pressure. So this is an example of POTS where you see here that the blood pressure does not fall when the patient is tilted. However, there is an exaggerated heart rate response and the, blood, the heart rate goes up from 90 or 100 up to more than 150. In orthostatic intolerance, you see that there is mild drop in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. However, the heart rate also goes up and there, as you see here, there are oscillations of the heart rate and the blood pressure because the system is under stress. In adrenergic failure, what you can see is that there is significant drop in blood pressure, much more below 20 in systolic and 10 in diastolic, 
And there is a mild increase in the heart rate as a compensatory mechanism, but this mechanism is insufficient to counteract the drop in the blood pressure. So the third component of autonomic function testing is the pseudomotor or the sweat responses. And in order to test those, we have the first test, which is called the QSART or the quantitative pseudomotor axonal reflex testing. This measures the function of the distal small nerve fibers that supply the sweat glands. And these are normally cannot be tested by your routine nerve conduction studies. We use multiple sites to compare the abnormalities and the distribution of sweating. So this technique relies on what's known as a multi-compartmental capsule that is divided into three compartments, A, B, C. And what we do is that we inject a solution of ionophorized acetylcholine inside compartment C. And this, comp and this solution, what it does is that it initiates a local axonal reflex stimulating the distal small nerve fibers. And this impulse travels antidromically to the first intersection point and then travel orthodromically to stimulate a, sweat, a nearby sweat gland. And that leads to a sweat response that is collected into the central part of the capsule. And the area under the curve is measured as the sweat output. As you see here on this patient, we attach four capsules, one in the forearm area, one in the proximal leg, one in the distal leg, and one over the foot. This is a normal QSART response when you cannot see any difference between the four areas in the forearm, proximal leg, distal leg, and uh, foot. However, in a patient with a small fiber neuropathy where the nerve conduction studies are normal, you can see here that the sweat response is normal in the forearm and the proximal leg. However, it's decreased in the distal leg and absent in the left foot. So the second test that we use for assessing the sweat response is the thermoregulatory sweat test, and that depends on the use of what's called the Alzarin S powder. This powder has a unique uh, character of changing its color from yellow when it's dry to deep purple when it's wet. So when this powder is exposed to human sweat, it changes its color on the area that sweats. So what we do in this test is that we dust this powder all, all over the whole body of the patient, and then we introduce them into the what's called the sweat chamber, which is a closed space that increases its temperature once the patient is, is inserted into it. And the goal is to increase their temperature up to 38 degrees Celsius or by, more, by one degree Celsius, whichever is higher. So these are pictures for the autonomic chamber or the sweat chamber, where this is the booth and uh, the patient is inserted through it and lay after they get dusted with the powder and the door is closed and the room starts to heat. And as the room starts to heat, the patient starts to sweat and the powder changes color. So in this patient who have small fiber neuropathy, as you can see here, that the powder changes its color where the patient normally sweat over the thigh and the proximal leg. However, over the foot and the distal leg, they did not sweat. And the powder did not change its color and the color remains yellow. And this shows a nice correlation between TST and QSART where the patient did not produce any sweat output over the foot. So these are the normal TST patterns, which in type 1 here, this is normal in male, while in type 2 and type 3 patterns, these are normal in females where they don't sweat that much over the anterior aspect of the thigh and the lateral aspects of the arms. So the common abnormal TST patterns that we usually encounter is, as I said earlier, the distal pattern, which is expected in small fiber neuropathy, the segmental pattern, which can be expected in unilateral spinal cord injury, 
A dermatomal pattern over T10 here, which can be expected in thoracic radiculopathy in a diabetic or herpes zoster patient. Or global anhydrosis, which can be expected in a very benign condition like chronic idiopathic anhydrosis or a severe pathologic condition like multiple system atrophy. So there is a value of combining the QSART with the TST in the sense that QSART only evaluates the postganglionic small nerve fibers, anything beyond the, beyond the sympathetic ganglia. However, the TST evaluates the whole pathway of sweating from the hypothalamus to the sweat glands. So if a patient has normal QSART that indicates that this part B is normal, while an abnormal TST, that means that the compartment A is abnormal, that means that this patient has a preganglionic pathology that can be seen in central autonomic dysfunction in cases of multiple system atrophy, for instance. So there is also a value of integrating the findings between the cardiovagal and cardioadrenergic testing and the sweat responses. So if a patient have reduced heart rate to deep breathing response and a low valsalva ratio, that indicates vagal dysfunction. And along with that, if they have distal anhydrosis, that may point the diagnosis to an autonomic neuropathy as can be seen in, as can be seen in diabetes or amyloid. If another patient have absent late phase two or, and, lay, and phase four in valsalva maneuver and orthostatic hypotension and head up tilt test, that indicates adrenergic failure. And if this is associated with global anhydrosis and QSART or TST, that can point to a generalized autonomic failure condition as in multiple system atrophy. So the common indications of autonomic nervous system testing include syncope and orthostatic intolerance, distal small fiber neuropathy, generalized autonomic failure as in cases of multiple system atrophy, benign autonomic disorder that may mimic threat life threatening conditions as chronic idiopathic anhydrosis, which looks pretty much in their sweat response as MSA. However, their uh, profile of other and other autonomic nervous system testing in the cardiovagal and cardioadrenergic responses are normal. It's use also useful in the detection of sympathetic dysfunction in cases of suspected reflex sympathetic dystrophy and restricted autonomic neuropathy cases as in diabetic neuropathy. So hopefully in the last few minutes, I have managed to convince you that autonomic function tests are instrumental in evaluating very common medical and neurologic problems. It's non-invasive. It's built on well understood physiologic basis. It's quantitative and localizing. However, it still requires specific equipment and trained personnel.